we can now grasp why the struggle between Russia and the West over Ukraine has such global significance. It is a conflict of visions. NATO assumes that its outcome will determine the fate of its core ideology, namely the belief that the expansion of liberal values will lead to global peace and prosperity. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, this has become NATO's defining belief and core mission. BRICS also assumes that the outcome of this war will determine the fate of its core ideology, the belief that cultural and political diversity are key to global peace and prosperity. Its defining belief and core mission increasingly lie in the institutionalization of civilizational multipolarity. I argue that civilizational multipolarity, which I call the BRICS ideology, is more sophisticated than most analysts assume, since it borrows much from the concept of sovereign democracy that Russia has pursued domestically since the early 2000s. Thank you, Pas thank you, Pascal. Thank you, colleagues, for <clears throat> for coming and <clears throat> listening to our efforts at wisdom. <laughs> um, I've amended my remarks a bit. Uh, they do not deal much specifically with Ukraine, but I hope they add something to the broader context. They are now entitled Neutrality, Security, and Civilizational Realism, a conundrum with lessons for Russia and Ukraine. And this is one of the authors of the concept of civilizational realism that I will be making reference to. It can be argued that the strategic ambition of regional great powers like Russia is to prevent the emergence of a global hegemon by promoting global non-alignment. And yet its own identity is in many ways tied to dominating in its own sphere of interest. Can a self-professed civilization state like Russia or any other define its sphere of interest in a way that is not threatening to others. Part of the answer may lie in how lesser regional powers like Ukraine view neutrality. When they turn to neutrality as a security strategy, such states face a stark choice. Passive neutrality allows them to serve as a buffer zone where rival powers can disengage at least temporarily or they could adopt an assertive neutrality and play rival powers against each other by constantly shifting allegiance. Both strategies strengthen national political autonomy, an essential attribute, I would say, of sovereignty. But passive or assertive neutrality is either one compatible with Western alliance structure, like NATO and the EU as we have seen in the case of Hungary, Slovakia, and Turkey, many see neutrality as being at odds with the values of the alliance and therefore a potential threat to them. Thus, neutrality poses a conundrum. On the one hand, the ability to pursue policies that reflect the distinctive cultural and political values of the nation are an essential aspect of national sovereignty. But too much independence could weaken the security shield offered by the alliance and make it vulnerable to threats from aggressive neighbors. Sometimes the criticism leveled at dissidents like Hungary, Turkey, and Slovakia is simply that their disloyalty undermines the security of the alliance. But this in turn rests on the idea that NATO reflects a distinctive civilizational identity and that the security benefits that derive from membership obliges nations to accept this specific liberal civilizational identity. This liberal civilizational identity is no longer limited to the cultural confines of Europe. It is, ex it is assumed to extend globally, which makes the expansion of NATO, and here I quote, to include 
Japan, Australia, South Korea, the Philippines, and any other democratic country like Argentina expresses a wish to join, end quote, as suggested in a recent open letter signed by more than 100 former and current political and military officials, the de facto reincarnation of what Francis Fukuyama once termed the end of history. Meanwhile, BRICS countries are promoting a very different view of the relationship between sovereignty and security, one that offers more space for political and values neutrality. Whereas NATO presumes that the cultural and political ideals of states must conform, lest global security be undermined, the BRICS alliance is premised on the idea that it is political and cultural diversity rather than unanimity that enhances global security. We can now grasp why the struggle between Russia and the West over Ukraine has such global significance. It is a conflict of visions. NATO assumes that its outcome will determine the fate of its core ideology, namely the belief that the expansion of liberal values will lead to global peace and prosperity. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, this has become NATO's defining belief and core mission. BRICS also assumes that the outcome of this war will determine the fate of its core ideology, the belief that cultural and political diversity are key to global peace and prosperity. Its defining belief and core mission increasingly lie in the institutionalization of civilizational multipolarity. I argue that civilizational multipolarity, which I call the BRICS ideology, is more sophisticated than most analysts assume, since it borrows much from the concept of sovereign democracy that Russia has pursued domestically since the early 2000s. At first, there was no foreign policy component to sovereign, to sovereign democracy since Russia was committed at that point to integration into the West. The hope that sovereign democracy might serve as a means of anchoring Russia in the West survived for a decade, but when it was abandoned, it was the emphasis on sovereignty that allowed Russia to transition smoothly from a pro-Western foreign policy to a policy of civilizational multipolarity. Since 2022, Russia has, in addition, begun to define itself as a civilization state. The meaning of this turn is still evolving, but one scholar who has thought deeply about the relationship between civilizations, multipolarity, and security is Moscow State's Boris, Professor Boris Mirzhuyev. Mirzhuyev makes the case that liberal internationalism is philosophically at odds with foreign policy realism, and that the incompatibility is preventing the resolution of many conflicts around the globe. The challenge facing world leaders is how to prevent this tension from escalating into a conflict that consumes the entire globe. Mirzhuyev su suggests that there is a framework within which this conflict need not become existential. He calls this framework civilizational realism. Civilizational realists believe that the current international system will not survive the clash between a liberalism that justifies the use of force to make states submit to a universe, universal moral framework and a realism that justifies the use of force to ensure the survival of every individual state. Both of these visions lead to conflicts that persist, deepen, and eventually cross national borders. Liberalism should therefore reconceive itself as but one voice among many, rather than the sole legitimate voice for all of humanity. Relinquishing liberalism's claim to universal moral authority is the key to global stability and peace because liberal imperialism has become intertwined with efforts to establish Western hegemony in military politics and economics, all of which rests on the claim of the moral superiority of Western liberal values. 
realism must likewise be reconceived so that sovereignty and power no longer serve as absolute moral justifications for state actions. Instead, a newly conceived state system should adopt the philosophical premise of multipolarity in which values neutrality is the summum bonum, and thus even countries with incompatible value systems must learn to coexist. How plausible is such a transformation? Mizhuyev is cautious, saying that it would be, quote, a major upheaval in the system of international relations, end quote. But there is a historical precedent for it. In the 17th century in Europe, leaders exhausted by nearly a century of incessant war warfare chose to reduce the role of religious values in international affairs. <clears throat> I believe that what civilizational realists are calling for is in effect a new treaty of Westphalia that like its predecessor would put an end to the prolifer proliferation of values-based warfare. The point of civilizational realism, says Mirzhuyev, is to make multipolarity functional, to institutionalize it as the representation of diverse civilizational poles, each one with its own cultural and political sphere of influence. To get there, he says, we must, quote, replace the dominant political language of international relations. This may seem far-fetched, until one recalls that it is also the call of one of the West's most well-known schools of international relations theory, social constructivism, which argues that new political opportunities can emerge from the elite's choice of a new political language. Therefore, replacing the dominant political language might begin by diagnosing our global malaise as due to fragmentation and suggesting a new political discourse that envisions a global society rooted in common ideals, shared identities, and meanings thereby avoiding the pitfalls of liberalism and realism, both of which lead to binary thinking. Any social constructivist solution, however, will take generations to implement, and the world may not have that long. I would therefore like to see it paired with the common sense diplomatic wisdom, what is called the English school of diplomacy, and with neutrality. Like civilizational realism, the English school affirms the importance of values diversity. This diversity requires that nations strengthen what the English school calls global society, which is defined as the arena of interaction where national interests overlap. Efforts to isolate any nation are considered irresponsible and dangerous because they tear at the very fabric of our global society. The proper task of diplomats can therefore best be likened to that of a marriage counselor where divorce is simply not an option. So how does neutrality fit in? I believe that neutrality, especially with respect to values, fits nicely into the framework of civilizational realism. As I suggested earlier, neutrality is a problematic concept to the extent that it promotes distinctive national, cultural, and political values, it can potentially make nations less secure. Political and values sovereignty, de facto independence, are thus always in tension with national security. But as the English school likes to point out, the modern nation state system owes much to the idea that in a healthy society, religious values should not only be kept separate from politics, but also rival it in importance. This ancient notion that our deepest values do not derive from politics, but transcend politics, is what ultimately allowed leaders to embrace neutrality with respect to values, even religious values, rather than fight to the death over them. This eventually led to the Peace of Westphalia 
the end of the Thirty Years' War, and the subsequent emergence of Europe as a global powerhouse for the next three centuries. We sorely need to recapture this type of neutrality today if we wish to avoid another global confrontation over values, one that would dwarf the devastation caused by the religious wars in Europe so long ago. Thank you.